and dictate series of webinars. Hope you're all safe and sound in your homes. Why we continue to bring the world's leading experts to you. Today we have with us Mr. Sunyu. He's an international speaker and a best-selling author on innovation and design who's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Journal Washington Post, Entrepreneur Magazine, and New York Times. His book, Iconic Advantage, challenges businesses from Fortune 500 to venture-backed startups to refocus their innovation priorities on building greater, greater iconicity and offers deeper insights on establishing timeless distinction and relevance. He most recently served as the Global VP of Innovation and Officer at VF Corporation, parent organization to over 30 global apparel companies, including the North Face, Vance, Timberland, Nautica, and Wrangler. While at VF, soon created a $2 billion innovation pipeline, established three global innovation centers, and initiated industry-leading design best practices. Prior to this, he worked at the Clorox company and Chikita brands, where he won company-wide awards for best advertising, best promotion, and best new product, and gained industry recognition from the Webby Award, Favorite Website Award, and Dope Award. He's also been recognized as a Northern California finalist for the prestigious Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Welcome to the show, so we are so glad to have you with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> what a nice introduction. I was like, oh, wow. Okay, who's that person? <laughs> well, it didn't stop. I mean, the, you know, awards and the recognitions are just, just there. What well, you forgot to, to mention is, is, is my whole history of many, many failures, but uh, that's, a, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll just start with the questions that we have for you today. The audience is dying to listen from you. So how closely is branding and innovation related according to you? Um, ideally, uh, they're very closely related. Now, Obviously, in the real world, some people will have inspiration and they'll innovate, and sometimes it'll be within what we would call the brand DNA, and sometimes it's out of the brand DNA. Um, for those of us who don't have unlimited resources and ha don't have all the hours in the world, uh, it's best served uh, to have innovation that's very much uh, centered on building your brand DNA. So having uh, the first step, which is having knowledge of your brand DNA specifically, you know, what are the values that you stand for? What's your purpose? Um, what's your true personality and character? And then inside of that, what is your mission? What do you hope to accomplish in this world? And then lastly, within that, what is your key point of difference that is sort of consistent with, consistent with both your values, your character, and that mission? Um, where you want to be innovating is building on that key point of difference and in support of your values and with consistency of your character. And so, um, yeah, I think innovation is very closely related to great branding. And uh, it both becomes, if you have a great brand, it both becomes the source of the innovation. And if you do that innovation well, then it becomes the reinforcement of building the brand. So it's both the source and kind of the destination of building great brands. So when devising the strategy for your firm, what should be given more priority? Uh, between uh, innovation and branding? Well, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. I, I think this, uh, it's less about priority and more about sequence. I think if you're just innovating and you don't have either a foundation or a North Star, in other words, you're not grounded in who you are and don't have a North Star of where you want to go, then I feel like that innovation can be very ineffectual. So I think in the sequence, it's first to invest some time and energy to kind of define who am I and where am I going, okay? Now, in terms of the balance of, let's say, resources, I don't think, I think the majority of your balance of resources is probably gonna to go to the innovation. But in terms of sequencing, spend 10 or 20% of that same effort and make sure you've nailed who you are and where you're going, okay? And if you've done that, then all that 80% you're spending on innovation will be that much more effectual. Um, so it's about sequencing. The prioritization of resources would definitely go to innovation. But if you don't do that first 20%, then that next 80%, to me, is less effectual. Absolutely. Totally. Right. So, so you've written a book about iconic advantage. Or rather, you've written about iconic advantage in your book. So can, I, can you elaborate a little bit on what it's about and you know, how can it be useful for organizations? Sure. I was very curious throughout my history um, of you know, both professional and personal development, 
of this idea that there are certain brands that have stood the test of time. And there are certain organizations that have followed a set of doctrines, best practices, principles that have allowed them to stay on top. And part of my struggle, like I said earlier, is I had a lot of starts and stops, a lot of failures, and that was always inspiration to say, well, how did that person do it better than me? And so what I did is um, I researched about 50 different companies that were doing the uh, process of creating timeless brands better than others and creating real iconic advantage, is what I call it. And I was trying to figure out, is this happenstance? Is it accidental? Or is this intentional? Is it strategic? And uh, fortunately for all of us, it was the latter, okay? And then what I tried to do is reverse engineer what is it that they did to remain on top? How do they create this timeless relevance and this timeless distinction? Uh, and so that was what the whole uh, uh, sort of question I was trying to answer through Iconic Advantage. And here's what I learned. Uh, we looked at 50 different companies that were doing this really well. And across all 50 of these companies, there were sort of three qualities that were helping them to become more iconic versus others. Uh, the first quality is that they were distinctive. They had something about them that helped them stand out versus their competition. Now, what's important is they weren't just different for different sake. Uh, they were distinctive in a way that was quality number two, highly relevant. Now, the trick isn't just to be relevant. It is the trick, like I said, it's about being timelessly relevant. So it's being relevant not only today, it was not only being relevant yesterday, but it's also being relevant for tomorrow. So how do you sort of create this spectrum of relevance from past, to, uh, from past present to the future? And so that was my part of the curiosity is to understand this idea of timeless relevance. Um, because if you're timelessly relevant for that distinction, and you've made that distinction relevant yesterday, today, and tomorrow, then all likelihood is that you will become the standard bearer. You'll have longevity and become the standard bearer for that distinctive relevance. And through that process of both um, longevity and having that distinctive relevance over time, uh, you will become the standard bearer, which will allow you to become iconic. The last thing is, um, the last quality is that they were universally recognized for that distinctive relevance. So they did a lot in their marketing, their distribution, and their innovation that reinforced this idea um, and made sure that as many people that they wanted to become iconic too, recognized them for that. And so if you have that um, sort of timeless recognition of your distinctive relevance, then you have a shot of becoming the standard bearer and then becoming iconic. And so that are, those are the three main qualities that companies should be thinking about as they build brands that will become iconic. So very curious, which was some of the, you know, just two, three brands that you started in the, you know, long list of brands that made the book? Yeah, I mean, um, I, luckily, I did work for a lot of iconic brands in uh, uh, VF, you know, the North Face, Vans, Timberland. Um, all of these are very iconic. And, you know, if you think about it for different reasons, they're different audience, different lifestyle focus, key uh, points of difference are, are distinctly different. Um, but I've also worked on brands, I won't name them, that aren't all that distinctive. And I've also worked on brands that weren't necessarily all based on lifestyle or emotion. You know, I worked at Clorox. And, you know, the key was how do you take, in, in, in the U.S., Clorox is really big for bleach. It's synonymous with bleach. You basically say Clorox and people already know you're talking about bleach. Um, so how did they achieve that? But more importantly, how do they continue to reinforce it? So I had the distinct pleasure of building one of the most profitable and um, fastest growing sort of uh, segments for the Clorox franchise, which is toilet bowl cleaners. So how did we take the idea of bleach and extend it into cleaning toilets, okay? And it was very fascinating. And I learned a lot about um, the balance between building on your iconic brand and leveraging your iconic brand, right? And how do you do it well? Because one of the big fears, I, I grew up, um, when I was stay with apparel, I grew up in an age where there were a lot of brands that sort of were hot one moment and then not, okay? Uh, one of the ones I remember growing up was a brand called Esprit, um, E-S-P-R-I-E-T. It was a apparel brand. I don't know if you remember it. Do, it's still those around. Big watches, right? Yes, yes. yes. They were still, they're still around. But uh, um, when I was growing up, they were the hottest 
fashion brand. And then they basically became so ubiquitous that they didn't stand for anything. And so the question for me is, how do you innovate in a way that maintains your distinctive relevance without growing so big and broadly that you stand for nothing? And uh, one of the brands that I'll say with apparel that I, I fear that is uh, the, the case is Gap. You know, I actually have a strong concern for Gap that they've grown so big, but they don't know what their distinctive relevance is and they haven't really invested against it. They just invested in a wide footprint and to become ubiquitous in a way that doesn't reinforce their distinctive relevance. Uh, that's a great work there. And uh, I just don't understand. You work with most of the companies that you mentioned that you studied as well. So, wow. Right. So on the same line, soon, one of the struggles for companies right now is being relevant as per the changing times. So what according to you and your study should be the priorities right now to achieve this? Yeah, so I think I get a lot of questions about, okay, we're in a world crisis, a pandemic. Um, does that change what I do? Does it change how I build my brand? Does it change how I innovate? All very worthy questions. And, you know, let's start by sort of simply looking at the uh, definition of innovation. For me, innovation is something new that creates value. The second part is very important. It has to create value, or to me, it's not really innovation, it's just invention. And, you know, you go to the U.S. Uh, Trademark and Patent Office, and there's a lot of invention, invention that never is commercialized. That's not innovation, okay? Innovation actually has to I think do some good, it has to create some value, it has to impact the world in ideally a positive way. Now, when you have that as a definition, there are really two dimensions that will spur this idea of something new that creates value. One of them is definitely creativity. It is seeing things and connecting dots and bringing uh, ideas together uh, and, and finding that connective tissue and that creative process is very important. But again, creativity for creativity's sake, you may get a lot of invention, you may have a lot of great um, ideation, but if you don't commercialize it, it's not innovation. So the second component that's really important for, the, for inspiring uh, innovation isn't just creativity, it's necessity, okay? And so necessity to me is the parents or the father or mother of great, not invention, but innovation. Um, and so if you marry great creativity with a fully strong understanding of necessity, uh, you're gonna come out with what I consider probably good ideas that actually will address a need. To me, what's really changed is not the process of innovation. You're still gonna have to marry creativity with necessity. What has changed is the context of necessity. I think probably more than ever, the need for safety is paramount. The need for trust is probably more paramount than ever before. Because of the new normal, the way we're gonna in interact with either social distancing or with a more, call it virtual online world, the need for connection is gonna be stronger than it has ever been. And lastly, I will say this, because people have more time isolated with themselves, the need for connection is important, but I also think the need, connection is with uh, your relationship with others, but the relationship with yourself is really important. And, and therefore, I think as you value who you are and what you're about and, and how you're interacting with others and interacting with brands, I think there's a greater need for meaning. Brands have to be more than just producing widgets or making profit. There has to be a heart and soul behind why the brand is doing what it's doing and how that connects much more deeper uh, to consumers and other businesses. And so I do think um, those things are going to be the necessity for safety, trust, connection, and meaning are going to be much greater than they've ever been. So as you go back and look at what you're innovating against, are you addressing those four things? And if you're not, how might you address them better? Going back to your early question about brand versus innovation, I would also probably first step, go back and look at your brand and say, of those four dimensions, are there any that we're currently addressing? Are there any that we could address well? And if we're not addressing either, any of those four, are we potentially irrelevant, right? Um, or do we need to 
contextualize and add one of those into the mix of, of either our value system or our key point of difference. So I, I do think um, all the things that you've probably learned in the business schools and from great you know, professors and consultants, most of those models, the approaches are pretty, pretty much still relevant. What I do think is different is the context of the idea of necessity and what that and what those needs are. Do you think the businesses which are not really addressing the need right now, they should pivot, you know, from their business model and start something else, or they should incorporate, you know, I mean, what can really be perceived as a need for customers right now? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Are there certain businesses now that are totally irrelevant, like movie theaters, maybe, you know, for at least a short term? And 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 I, I think there's not a simple answer to this. What I would do is for every business out there, it's probably a good time to take a pause and say, the world context has changed. The idea of um, the, what's needed, the necessity of both consumers and businesses and how we can provide goods and services, whether it's B2C or B2B, um, all that has changed. And the four dimensions I mentioned are much more paramount. First step would be understand that, okay? Understand how the world's changed. Don't panic, understand that. The second is, let's just do a quick exercise and look at our brand pyramid and say, in this new context, in this new normal, are there parts of the brand that are still relevant? Are there parts that are irrelevant? Um, are there parts that we need to either edit or accentuate or potentially grow from, okay? Um, and I do think that's an important exercise for everyone to ask. There will be a situation where maybe your brand, the way it's set up, is just not that relevant. So um, that's even, that's not even talking about the business model itself, right? So I start with the brand. Then I would say, okay, how do we make money manifesting this brand, okay? And the structural element of how people interact with you may have changed. Like where they're going, are they going to where you're at? No, okay, that's, that's less about the brand. That's, less, that's a structural element of, of how they're buying goods or services and you're not in the context of where they wanna be, okay? So maybe you need to reinvest and uh, sorry, re in, um, reevaluate um, your where to place, okay? So that to me is a strategy question of where are you currently playing? What markets, what geographies, what um, product segments, uh, what consumer slash uh, uh, market segments, and then lastly, where are your channels or dis of distribution and, and, and where are you being made available? Look at all those and say, huh, am I, from a business point of view, in the right where to place? Hmm, if I'm not, then again, that might be more of a business model shift. Uh, and then lastly is, based on who I am, my brand, assume that somehow we've recasted that to be much more relevant in context. We've looked at our where to place from a strategic point of view, where we make choices about where we're going to you know, sell, sell products in and then where and all that. Um, if those are still relevant, then lastly, I would ask the question, um, does any of that allow me to create competitive advantage? And are there any how to wins within that? Okay. So I think that is an important process that businesses need to go through. Like, okay, how do you make your brand relevant in today's context? Are your current where to plays relevant in today's context? And lastly, your previous competitive advantage, how you went to market, how do you win? Um, are those relevant or do I need to reevaluate those? Thank you so much for answering that. I think it's going to answer a lot of people. You know, we've all been wondering for the businesses that, you know, are not doing well right now. What next? What do you do? So to my next question to you, economic downturns are mostly the time, you know, when previously most of the great products have come to market. So what should the ideal process be for firms right now for focusing on innovation? Yeah, I, again, like I said, I don't think the approach has changed. I do think um, the input um, and what what you're and what you're listening for um, are different. And I think you're going to let the inputs be a source of new creativity. But I don't think the process of innovation. I, you know, like whether let's say there's so many different innovation models. Some people take a design thinking approach. To me, doesn't change. 
what you're listening for and what you're trying to uncover new insights around um, may be about the new normal. And I think you have to factor that in, but the process of developing a low resolution prototype and then testing it and then retesting that based on those insights doesn't change. The insights make. Okay, uh, whether it's lean innovation, same thing. The context of how you're doing lean innovation is changing, but the process of lean innovation doesn't change. Agile innovation, same thing, all valid models. I just do think the context of both um, the inspiration and, and the source of insights that go into the development of the ideas has changed, but also where you're testing them and how you're getting input to I think uh, fine tune those ideas, uh, you have to do it in the context of the new normal. You can't use your old models to say, okay, well, our basis tests show that, yeah, you know, based on predictive analytics, we scored 79% on top two box, that's gonna be perfect. No, you need to actually test it just today versus some model that might've been uh, a forecast model done a year ago, or even done six months ago, right? So very different. And this will be again the case once the pandemic gets over and you know things settle down. You, you'll yes. have to take a look again. And I, oh, absolutely. I do really believe that you know in the next month or two, brands will need to sort of come back and say, how does my brand, how does the where to play choices and the how to win choices, how are they in the context of this new normal? I think that's that was really needed as well. I mean, you know, you need one push to just go back to the basics and think what else can I do. Right? So, um, if any, you know, actionable pointers if you can give to businesses to, you know, develop that iconic advantage. Yeah, I, I would say this. Um, have a good sense of who you are and within that, what is your key point of difference? That point of difference, if you're looking for a great point of difference, should be a situation of, um, you know, if you're trying to find a good point of difference, is something that you are actually really good at. What are your strengths? Okay, so, so we're thinking Venn diagram with sort of an intersection of three circles. So one circle is definitely, what are you good at, okay? The next circle should be, what do consumers or businesses that you are servicing, providing goods and services for, what do they need? What do they want? What's important to them? And I, I think that circle has definitely shifted, okay? So you need to understand in the, the changing environment of that question, um, how does your strengths fit? And then lastly, good points of difference have the context of what are your competitors doing? Ideally, you want to find something that you're really strong at that consumers or businesses really need that very few people are doing. Okay, that to me is a very ownable point of difference. All right. So I would go back and really understand what is your key point of difference within uh, your brand and brand DNA and your messaging. Bring that to life through innovation. Um, and the one thing I would probably suggest, and, and this is sort of a you know, I, I have uh, one other Indian client and, and I, I, I talk to them about this too. Um, I, I think what India has done such a good job at is really, I think, um, helping scale services, helping to scale um, uh, really important products. And, and I think the area where uh, I think innovation could really be, uh, I think, step changed or, or even, even enhanced is the idea of innovating around meaning. Okay, creating the idea of story and using story as a way to um, justify, I think, higher margins, higher price, um, greater consumer and business loyalty. Um, and it's so funny. I think the human race is, is a very particular, uh, I think one of the most unique species on the, on the planet because we can create meaning out of nothing. And I'll show you a, a simple example is, let's say I had a big pen, which is a very inexpensive pen, okay? And I had the Mont Blanc pen, right? Those are the two. And I said to you, which of these two pens are really um, more iconic to me? 99 out of 100 people would probably pick the Mont Blanc pen. But if I told you a story about this big pen, maybe it's this big pen, okay? And I said, actually, this is a paper made, but it doesn't matter, okay? okay. Pretend this is a big pen. And I said to you, um, I only use this pen once a year, and my wife only uses it once a year. It's 13 years or 15 years old. She's going to kill me. 15 years old. And we use it once a year to write wedding, wedding anniversary cards for each other. And it, it was because it was the pen that the Justice of Peace gave to us when we got married to sign our marriage certificate. Okay. 
Then if I said to you, which of these two pins are more iconic to me? Obviously the equation has changed because I've told you the story. By the way, I just made up that story. That is the power of story. We can create meaning out of nothing. And so the area I think uh, I, I would uh, really push hard on, on, on my Indian friends is really get behind the idea of creating great stories. Story behind your brands, behind your businesses, behind your people. I think uh, India as a country has such a great story. Tell it. Romanticize it. Absolutely. Well, on that note, thank you so much you for spending your time with us. It's been a pleasure having you and you know talking to you. And we really hope to have you here soon to you know talk about further branding for us as well and for the customers. Again, you know, thank you for your for your time. It's uh, you know been an eye opener really for branding and for iconicity. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>